Hello and welcome to another episode of me spinning a wheel. As you should be able to see on your screen, I actually have a visible wheel on there for you guys to see instead of just showing you my phone. So yeah, let's just get into it. Let's see what team we're going to talk about first. Let's see where this lands. Looks like the Jazz maybe finally. Oh wow, very close to getting the Jazz. You know what, I'm going to talk about the Jazz anyways, but I will say something quick about the Rockets. Jabari Smith, who was the third overall pick in this year's draft, has come out to a pretty shaky start to his NBA career, and they're losing a lot of games there in Houston. Eric Gordon is playing a lot more than I thought he would, but I still think he might get moved. You know, maybe he'll be involved in that Jay Crowder deal that's bound to happen at some point. I think Eric Gordon would honestly be a really nice fit for the Suns this season. But yeah, let's see if we can get it to land on the Jazz, actually. I want to see. Okay. It didn't land on the Celtics. We'll talk about the Jazz when they come up. I don't want to cheat it. The Celtics have been probably the best team in the league so far. At least last time I looked at the standings, I'm pretty sure they had the best record. So, you know, it turns out my prediction from early this offseason is actually a lot more accurate than the one that I made right before preseason. Joe Mazzulla has come out and been a really good coach for them so far this season. I guess that bench was just full of those guys because Will Hardy on the Jazz has been really good too. That's a little bit of a Jazz teaser, I guess. But yeah, Tatum looking like he might be, he's probably in the top three or four for MVP this season, I'd say. Taking his game up a notch yet again. But yeah, next team, Blazers. For the Blazers, you know, definitely not tanking. They've had a lot of close games. I think they've started to lose more lately. I think they've been without Dame also. Oh, wow. Okay, yeah. So they're a lot farther down there than they were last I saw. So they're at the 11 spot with 11 wins and 11 losses. But, you know, the Western Conference is really tight because the 500 teams sit at the 9 to 10 to 11 spots, and then it jumps up a tiny bit to the Jazz at the 6th seed, being 14 and 11, and then it stays pretty leveled all the way up to the 1st seed, Phoenix, with 15 and 7. So there's a total difference of 4 games, from the 1st seed all the way to the 11th seed. Compare that to the East, where there's an 8-game difference from the 1st seed to the 11th seed. But yeah, Jeremy Grant has been playing really well for the Blazers. I think ultimately they will end up in the range that I predicted them at, which was uh, just below 500 or just, you know, right around the 500 area, somewhere in between 37 and 43 wins, probably. But, you know, they came out to an even hotter start, though, than that uh, coming into the season, which was a little bit of a surprise. I think they shocked most people as in, like, they're a better team than a lot of other people are giving them credit for. But I think, I don't know, I still have a similar feeling about them, which is they're probably like a play-in team, somewhere around the 9 or 10 seed. Yeah, next team. Anthony Simons, though, has been really fun for the Blazers. Forgot to mention. All right, next team is the Grizzlies. Cool. I just looked at the standings, but I can't remember where the Grizzlies were. They're at the four seed, 13 and 9. Which, I don't know. I guess, I don't know. I don't have much to say about the Grizzlies, I guess. They're a pretty similar team to what they were last year. They don't have a lot of turnover. They lost Kyle Anderson, and I thought that would mean more minutes for Zaire Williams, but... Just going off, I guess, just like the two games that I've seen from the Grizzlies this year, I don't think I saw Zaire Williams out there at all. So I don't know about that. It seemed like last year, his rookie year, everybody was talking about him, you know, being one of the main guys on this team eventually. But I know Santi Aldama came in and was filling in for Jaron Jackson Jr. at the beginning of the season while he was out. He did a really good job there. I think Jaron Jackson Jr. has looked pretty good since he's come back from what I've seen in the box scores and stuff. And I did see uh, Kings game recently between Grizzlies and the Kings, he, and he had a pretty good game there. Jaw had an insane game. Uh, it's well, really just a insane fourth quarter. I think he had 20 points in the fourth quarter, and that was just a really fun game. The Kings seemed like they did everything they could to lose that game down the stretch because they had a pretty comfortable lead, but somehow it was just turnover after turn. It literally reminded me of like in 2K when you're playing against a computer and you keep switching over to the other team uh, to just turn the ball over to try to get your team to win the game. I don't know how it was happening, but like every single pass that was being thrown was getting picked off. Uh, there was a lot of bad decision making on the King side, but also it felt like Dylan Brooks was getting away with a lot of contact <laughs> at times. Like, like there was one pass where like Fox was, he kind of jumped up to make a pass. And I feel like the pass would have been just fine. It would have been on target and clean if Dylan Brooks didn't like body him in the air. Like he really put his body into him and was trying to take the ball basically. But you know, when a guy's in the air like that, you just like start kind of pushing him. Seems like that should be a foul. And there were a couple other moments where I just thought, hmm, I wonder if that's a thing. Like Dylan Brooks is just, maybe he gets away with a lot of contact more than other people would. Probably because of how foul prone he is. The refs just don't want to foul him out every single game maybe. Not sure exactly. But yeah, I think the Grizzlies will end up in the top six, I think. I, I guess I wouldn't be surprised if they ended up like seven or eight, but I think they're a clear, like one of the main contenders for the top six, that's for sure. All right, so next team, we got the Thunder, which we've already talked about. 
So we're going to do another one. Let's see who this one is. The Raptors. Pascal Siakam is on my fantasy team. Uh, he was out for a while, for like a few weeks, honestly. But he's back now, putting up good fantasy stats. I know Scotty Barnes has been playing better, especially at the beginning of the season, at least. You know, he was shooting a higher percentage off the dribble and from three than in his rookie season. The Raptors are just a nice, feisty team. They're sitting at the eight spot right now, 11-11. I think they'll end up a little bit higher than that. I think I predicted them to have 46 wins, I want to say. Somewhere in that range. So yeah, I'm not, I don't feel really any different than I did before the season. So yeah, next team. Let's see who we get. And it is the Clippers. Have we talked about the Clippers? I don't think we have. They have a lot of wings, like too many, honestly. Uh, one thing that's really funny is they've been one of the slowest teams in the league the past several years, really in the Kawhi and PG era, because their whole roster is just built up of these 3 and D wings that aren't like necessarily end to end, you know, ball handlers, not really slashers, not a lot of slashers on the team for the most part. But, you know, the addition of John Wall this season has added that dimension to their team, I feel like, into their offense, you know, just that north south area of the offense uh they're sitting at 13 and 10 with a lot of games with Kwai out i think he's back now he might be out again though <laughs> to be honest i never know uh with him um i don't know if paul george has missed i feel like no never mind paul george has definitely missed some games uh the nuggets played the clippers recently i think i watched some clippers games recently i can't remember now if it, it was a nuggets game most games i watch are nuggets games i'd say well probably even them out like i watch the entirety of nuggets games for the most part but like other games, I usually just watch like the last several minutes, somewhere in that range. Like if it's a night that doesn't have a Nuggets game, I'm usually skipping around on League Pass, going to the games that are close and in like the crunch time minutes, just flipping between those games. When one of them goes to a break, I switch it over to another one. And I actually even uh, have done that quite a bit on Nuggets games nights. And I just put off the Nuggets game until all the other games of the night are over. And then I go, because I'm recording the Nuggets game, I'll just go watch the whole Nuggets game not live, but yeah. Anyways, I'm talking about the Clippers right now. I honestly think that they would be a pretty good destination for the Jay Crowder trade. Not necessarily a destination for Jay Crowder, but they could get involved in the Jay Crowder trade in some way because I do know, at least at the beginning of the season, uh, what Phoenix was reporting, or at least what was reported that Phoenix was saying was that they were wanting to get a wing back, like somebody to fill that same role, the Jay Crowder spot. So, you know, like a 6-5 at least to 6-9 range 3D wing. And um, the Clippers have a swath of those. So, you know, maybe Jay Crowder gets sent somewhere. Like, the, if we're talking about the teams that need Jay Crowder right now, this is kind of turning into a different video, but I feel like this is something I want to talk about. So let's just do it. If we're talking about the teams that need Jay Crowder right now, teams that come to mind, Cleveland, number one, comes to mind because they really need to upgrade that wing spot on their team. But there's not a lot on, I guess, Levert, honestly. Would Levert work well on the Suns, maybe? Like, he, that's not the piece that the Suns originally said they want back in return. But me, looking at the Suns roster, thinking about where they could upgrade or where they could use a guy. You know, it wouldn't hurt to get a Jay Crowder guy back, but I'm thinking maybe get somebody who can handle a bit. You know, a smaller wing that has some ball handling capabilities. Like an Eric Gordon that I mentioned before with the Rockets. Or maybe like a Karis LeVert. Who knows? I don't know if the Suns would go for that. They could do a three-way trade, send LeVert to the Clippers for some reason. I don't know why the Clippers would want LeVert, I guess. There's plenty of guys on the Clippers to choose from to come be the new Jay Crowder off the bench in Phoenix. Like Robert Covington could work there. Um, not, I guess, in the same exact way, but similar. Uh, who else? Marcus Morris, Nick Batum, Amir Coffey, Norman Powell. You know, the Raptors could be a team. They've got a few of those guys too. But going back to what teams would want Jay Crowder right now, Cleveland definitely be one. There's another one I was just thinking about recently. I can't remember what it was though. Was it the Bulls? No, Heat. Heat would need a Jay Crowder, like desperately, honestly. The Heat need a lot of stuff, to be honest. This might be just turning into a Heat part, but I don't know. On the next podcast episode, which I think we'll, I'll record somewhat soon with Jacob, hopefully, I'll we'll do a segment on that. We'll just talk about Jay Crowder trades because there's a lot of directions we can go with it. I don't want to do that all here right now. Let's try to squeeze one more team in here. Pistons. Have we talked about the Pistons? I think we have, but it was in a video that I didn't end up putting out because I think the audio was messed up on it or something. But I'm pretty sure at least. Pretty sure that was a throwaway. But the Pistons have been a lot worse than I thought they were going to be. They've been like at the bottom of the league, which, you know, isn't much worse than I thought. But I thought they would be a little bit more competitive than they are. They're at 6 and 18. I had them put down for about 32 wins, I think, is where I had them. So definitely not impossible, I guess. But yeah, another guy that might be moved that'll be important for some contending teams is playing for the Pistons in Bojan Bogdanovic. 
my thing that I was wanting to talk about with the Pistons before the season isn't as applicable now. But the thing was, I, I kind of wanted to talk about how I like the direction that I thought the Pistons were going, which I'm not going to say that they've abandoned that completely, but it would help, I guess, if their record was better, it would help my point here. I like the idea of them putting together a roster with some veterans and some guys that can handle the ball to build around Cade with instead of letting that Cade Cunningham development kind of go in the same path or the same direction that it has with Trey Young with the Hawks and Luka Doncic on the Mavs just because I think the problem that ended up happening with those teams was they put too much into just you know let's have our one guy you know Trey or Luka let's just have them spam high screen and roll just put their usage at all-time highs have the offense run through them just about every single play and you know if a player can only play like that that makes it really hard for you to build around them in a way that is dynamic like putting in other pieces into the offense that are like stars it's hard to pair those players with other stars that you know a lot of their value comes from being on ball because you're making it so like they can strictly only play on ball you're basically losing any of the on ball value that another teammate would be able to add you're not utilizing any of that value so i think it would be interesting to see what would have happened if those teams the mavs and the hawks would have built around trey and luca with mixing in some other ball handlers and some other stars maybe um i know that stars aren't always available but guys like how the pistons are doing it you know the pistons don't have any other stars but they're mixing in guys that um their play style requires them to have the ball like a Jaden Ivey as the rookie um like an Alec Burks well I guess it doesn't require them to have the ball but they can they definitely that's one of the parts of their games you know like Alec Burks could just be a 3 and D wing he like could work in that role but he also is a good ball handler pretty good decision maker he can be like a backup point guard essentially they have Corey Joseph on there who's just like a strictly traditional point guard even Bojan Bogdanovic he gets a lot of reps in the pick and roll at least he did in Utah with Gobert um he's pretty useful in that like weak side pick and roll game so yeah it's mixing it up putting the ball in some other people's hands allowing Cade to kind of develop in two different ways being able to play on ball and off ball which I think is going to be useful especially for his play style even more so than Luca at least I don't know if I'd say more so than Trey but more so than Luca at least because Cade is shown to be a pretty good like catch and shoot three-point shooter at least in college you know he, he projects to be a good 3 and D guy basically so yeah I think it's good to try to develop him in a way that you can have another star on the team and while that star is having his time to shine Cade can kind of fill in as like a high level 3 and D player and you know be able to be useful alongside another star without necessarily having to dominate the ball like we're seeing Trey struggle with with uh, DeJounte Murray in Atlanta just imagine what an offense could look like if you ran Trey in a little bit more of like a not necessarily like a Steph role but kind of like, like a minimized Steph role maybe more like a Seth Curry role not on the whole, I'm saying, but when the ball's in the other player's hands. So when the ball is in DeJounte's hands, you could have Trey Young coming off some pin down screens and off ball actions to get open looks from three, you know, just catch and shoot plays and stuff like that. I feel like Trey would be pretty useful in that type of scenario, but it doesn't seem like his off ball activity really seems like that's an option for him. Like, I don't know if it's a coaching thing. I think it has to be to a certain extent. It doesn't look like they've even tried to take the ball out of Trey's hands. It's just kind of been, it's kind of been DeJounte Murray's role, it looks like, to try to fit along Trey in the minutes that they have together, which hasn't been a lot. But uh, when they are on the court together, it looks like DeJounte is strictly off ball for the most part. So yeah, I guess my thing is, I think that the idea of mixing in those other guys like Bojan Bogdanovic and Alec Burks and Killian Hayes even, and Jaden Ivey, Corey Joseph, I think there might be a couple other players I'm forgetting about, but other guys that are going to be using the ball, putting the ball on the floor, bringing it up the court, putting it in other guys' hands, attacking the basket, doing those things. I just like that idea for Cade's development long-term. But yeah, I think that'll be it for this video. We've been talking for a while now, but hopefully we get to the Jazz and the Heat soon. Those are both teams I want to talk about. Uh, Warriors wouldn't be bad to talk about. Sixers even. You know, there's some teams that we can get to that we definitely haven't yet. Hopefully I can keep track in my mind of which teams we have talked about, which teams we haven't. But yeah, stay happy, stay healthy, and I'll talk to you guys next video.